Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Security Angle. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at The Cube Research. I am joined today by my frequent co-host and collaborator, Joe Peterson, fellow analyst, brilliant engineer, member of the Cube Collective Community of Independent Analysts, for a conversation about data warehouses and securing them. And we are joined today by the illustrious, world-famous Billy Spears, CISO at Teradata. Billy, welcome. Hey everyone! Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me here. For those of you who don't know me, hi. My name is what? My name is what? My name is <laughs> still Billy Spears, and I'm so glad to be here with both of you. <laughs> this is going to be a treat, viewers and listeners. This is Billy never comes unprepared, so I love it. All right, to set the stage here a little bit, we're going to take a walk down memory lane. The concept of data warehouses originated in the 1980s. Oh, my God, that's a long time ago, and I'm really old. Um, IBM researchers Barry Devlin and Paul Murphy developed the business data warehouse to help data flow from operational systems into decision support systems. Bill Inman an American computer scientist and someone largely considered the father of the data warehouse, defined a data warehouse as a collection of data that supports the decision of management. Inman wrote the first book, held the first conference, and offered the first classes to teach the industry about data warehouses. Kind of cool, isn't it? I think it is anyway, but I'm a geek. Early data warehouses were large-scale systems used to report and analyze data, and of course, they were primarily on-prem. Of course they were. They required a lot of redundancy because most organizations had multiple DSS environments for different users. Today, the average size of a modern data warehouse is over 100 terabytes. For comparison purposes, Walmart achieved the first one terabyte data warehouse in 1991, also a very long time ago. Data warehouses store data from a variety of sources, including customer information, product information, employee-related personnel information, sales records, invoices, you name it, they're in our data warehouses. They are designed to support business decision-making through data collection, consolidation, analytics, and of course, research. We've seen data lake house, data warehouses rather, evolve into variations. We've got the data lake house, we've got the data cube, we've got data silos, and we've got data swamps. And all of these repositories have in common, uh, what they have in common besides data is the need for security, which leads us to you, Billy. And it sets the stage for our conversation today about securing the data warehouse. We are so glad to have you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm very, very excited. <laughs> <laughs> you notice how I pause there to let you just, you know, bring your bring your noises. So here I am, you know, teeing you up. So before we dive in more fully, Billy, you're a busy guy. You are on the CNBC Tech Executive Council. You're a venture advisor for Avenir, you're a product advisory. You're a product on the product advisory board for Palo Alto Networks. You're a cybersecurity board advisor for Cybertar, and chances are good I missed a few in there. All this advisory work is work you do in addition to your role as a CISO at Teradata, which is wildly impressive. So now that we know you're an overachiever, uh, walk us a little bit, if you would, through your career journey. We'd love to know a little bit more about your backstory. Yeah, it's awesome, Shelly. I think it's a record. Have you ever heard of a DJ? What? And they sort of stop. But the idea here is uh, I'm like an innovator. I love technology and I love the value of what technology can do to drive uh, efficiency and operational outcomes for companies. So whether it's from the CISO perspective with all the risks and the controls and the things, whether it's developing new technology for companies to really harness that value to their customers, or whether it's driving something that's sellable to, to the, the mass market, all of that stuff is incredible because it starts with data or it aligns with technology. And for me, that just gets me really, really excited. So if you look at sort of my career trajectory, I started as a software developer a very, very long time ago. Uh, and then from there, I've sort of progressed in different places in my career. And most of those journeys, if you really look at them, it's all been, it's all been about innovation or how we can drive the outcome. Uh, most of that is through the lens of security. I love security because as most of your audience will know, you get to sort of break things apart, figure out what's going wrong, and then put it back together better than how it started in the first place. I also love designing solutions that have this impact with customers before they even know they need to resolve something. 
Uh, and I like to think security professionals are there behind the scenes for you, stressing out, staying awake. So A, you get a good sleep at night and we make sure uh, that all the things are working uh, appropriately so you don't have to worry about those things inside of either your your company, your university, uh, your technology uh, that maybe you're investing in or the product that you're developing. So all of that can be very, very useful if you have the right uh, consultation at your side. Absolutely, absolutely. Security is the foundation for everything, really. I mean, in my world, in my in my sort of nerdy brain, it and really, you know, you talked about all these different things, but security is important for our personal lives as well, you know, right. uh, and all of the data breaches that happen and all of those sort of things that the people who are often affected the most are ordinary average people like the three of us, although oh, there's nothing really average about you two, but I'm pretty average. So there you go. <laughs> Well, it is average. It's just a really long, long word. I like to use a different A word, which is awesome. Sort of <laughs> okay. Now, if this was like Sesame Street, we would say keyword awesome with one, two, three of my favorite friends talking to an unlimited audience outside. I think what's cool about security has been post COVID because the idea of the traditional network barrier was inside your company before, <laughs> and that's extended to your house. So uh, mm -hmm. another key nugget for all of your listeners, and I know, Joe, you can compliment here, is remember to change your Wi-Fi password. Remember to be careful what's on your home network because you almost become uh, the, the help desk inside of your household. So you got to be careful uh, who you let in, what they're doing on your network, and how that traverses all those smart devices that you have in your home. Because another key lesson is we spend 10 to $12 billion in industry focused on people security. Yeah. But if we go backwards a little bit, we think about how many actors are actually on your networks. Boom. I know everyone at home is coming up with all these numbers. And if I had thought bubbles that could pop out of my head, I'm sure we would have random numbers everywhere. But the idea is there's two, right? There's two actors on every network. There's people. That's the easy one. And there's machines. We focus on the people. We forget about all the machines. We just want to be smarter. We want to have AI. We want all this stuff to interact with us. But you got to remember those things, those machines that you're connecting also have risks. And we have to yeah. consider those risks even through uh, the fog of innovation. Well, and Joe and I actually just had a conversation about this on an, on an earlier episode, but you know, for all the totally... Um, from a personal standpoint, you have to do things like taking that router out of the box and installing it and not using the default password, you know, and changing your Wi-Fi password on a regular basis, setting up a guest network. And that, so there's so many things that, that are important when it comes to keeping safe. But I digressed. I want to laser back in on data warehouse security. So Billy, walk us through a little bit of what's involved here in this in this realm of data warehouse security. It's a it's a it's an explosion question, right? Because you you so eloquently kind of described what a data warehouse was. So for all the listeners that don't know, go get one. I have to know a company that has an amazing one. You know, <laughs> our parallel architecture and our processing is second to none, especially with the larger workloads. Uh, shameless plug, but always available for your needs. Uh, when we think about the security of those warehouses, uh, it involves a traditional uh, CIA triad. And if those of you don't know, that's confidentiality, integrity, and availability, but mostly around the data stored within the warehouse. Because again, we don't know what data you're putting in. We just assume it's high value data that you want to continually uh, gain insights from. So given that these warehouses aggregate massive amounts of, of potentially sensitive information from various sources, whatever you want to bring in, they can be a prime target for cyber attacks. You know, some common security concerns in this space include things like unauthorized access. We saw that a little bit this summer, right, where uh, a, a large data warehouse was known and they, they, they published a potentially great product and, and folks, the customers, didn't then take that product and, and embed the security that they need to on their side. And it caused a little bit of consternation and caused a little bit of unauthorized access uh, and, and some more severe consequences. Uh, things like the larger uh, construct of data breaches. In my business, the B word is a tough word to get around uh, because you have so much event, so many logs to, to consider, but there are so many other people that are curious, right? It goes back to the very start. Of, I mean, remember, we have TCP and then we had an IP on top of it. And the idea is we wanted to have uh, some security around natural transmissions between universities uh, and the government, believe it or not. Yeah. Those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I give you some homework right there in a subtle way. Going back to data warehouses, uh, the idea is think about your insider threats. I could put as much security uh, in your warehouse as you want, but if you simply are super polite, like a 
I got a, a concierge and you walk them past the security, we're, we're in big trouble. So uh, make sure your insiders know that if you want us to recognize them, put chairs over their head and walk out of the building and we'll know exactly who they are and we'll go stop them and ask for appropriate controls. Uh, data leakage. This is your, your accidental uh, sort of spillover of things. Sometimes with best intent and curiosity, uh, data tends to leak out. So you want to have those A to Z sort of security controls in place. So if something like that happens, a uh, simple rule or uh, an event sort of alert, you might call fires off to you and let you know. So you can come there uh, like a great handyman and we can help plug that hole or fix it by remediating that security. And then lastly, you always have vulnerabilities and they come from all kinds of different places. But in this particular context, we're talking about vulnerabilities in the underlying infrastructure. Super important. And then I think the other couple of things I would add on is uh, poor identity management, in inadequate encryption of, of data, of both data at rest and in transit also uh, pose significant risk to the integrity and security of the warehouse as a whole. Uh, so those are lots of things wrapped into a nice bow back to, to you, Shelly. And Joe, if you want to add, please do. Lots of security concerns. Absolutely. You checked a lot of the boxes. Thanks. You know, I try. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's a lot in, in a, a condensed format. I think the, the idea around what you do with the warehouse, remember it's, this is for companies, this is your, your most significant data, right? And it, it yeah. probably has the largest grouping or sampling of the data uh, in your company. So it's really important to not forget about the A to Z of security. Uh, because if you, if you miss one thing, it can definitely have a cascading effect on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Joe, I think that you uh, yeah. wanted to talk a little bit about some uh, security. Yep, I did. I did. I, you know, Billy, you teased on a couple of the things when you answered Shelly's questions, but I wonder if you could dig in a little bit more. You mentioned three that perked my ears, identity and access management, right? Who's coming in and what permissions do they have? Um, encryption of traffic. And that's, you know, in flight and at rest. Um, so, and any others that you want to add. So could you sort of, you know, double click on some of those a little bit and talk to people about what they need to think about when they're building that data warehouse? Yeah, fair, fair question. Thanks for, for the follow-up there, Joe. For, let's start with uh, encryption, because I think when people think about encryption, they, they simply say, hey, here's an encryption. Here's an encryption standard. I'm going to follow that standard and I'm good to go. And they forget about there's lots of ways to, to, to get into the source of the data. There is lots of ways to be maybe a trusted insider into that information. And there's lots of ways to extract that data out. So for, for as a high level, what I tell people, it's really important to encrypt all your data period, both at rest, in transit. And really what you're trying to do is mitigate the risk of, of things like interception or unauthorized access, which kind of leads into the next part of that joke. When we talk about uh, identity and access control, again, this is the people side of the equation, right? So we want to make sure that there's not just uh, ways to get in or, or multi-factor authentication included on the outside, but you also want to have role-based access applied here. You don't want everybody that gets in to have access to all the roles, rows or all the columns of your data. They only need to have access to whatever they need. I would employ everybody to uh, adopt the principle of least privilege to ensure only the authorized users have access to the specific data based on their, their roles or, or the permissions that you'd like to allocate. And remember, there's lots of other people in, inside of your, your data warehouse. There might be service providers where you pay people to maintain your database, or you pay people to maintain your technology. Again, you're going to want to assign them roles too. You don't want to just give them global admin because they'll have the keys to your kingdom, which kind of uh, bypasses or it kind of precludes the security that you've put around that data warehouse. And then the last thing, uh, I forgot the last part of your question, Joe. I think it was around maybe military. I can't remember. Sorry. No, I, I didn't ask them, but you, you know, you can go there and then I want to, I want to circle back to something that you talked about as it relates to RBAC. Yeah, totally fair. I think if I, if I just go, go down the thought of monitoring for a second, I think it's a natural place where my brain goes next. Uh, it's important also, once you have this stuff hooked in, you continuously monitor these activities, things like data access, system events. Uh, and and I, I would encourage folks to implement logging and auditing that detect anomalous or unauthorized access much earlier. You can either in, ingest this into your SIM or a different logging system of your choosing. 
but not just the logs, but also the people. Uh, who are the privileged users in those accounts? Who are those privileged users? What are they doing? Uh, so if you make a change and it corrupts your data or something, you can roll it back or you understand what that defined moment was so you can recover much quicker uh, because resiliency is key, especially in these large data warehouses. Uh, you have to be able to fail over very quickly. Most people are dependent on uh, maintaining the, the four or five nines of uptime, uh, like my company provides, just a shameless plug again. Uh, but the, the idea here, it's, it's really, really important that if something happens or you feel like uh, there's something strong enough where you have to go back to something else, you, you can fail over to, to alternative workloads. Yeah, that was a great answer. I want to stay there a minute because I think people get tripped up and think it's overlap sometimes when we talk about things like pool based access control, least privilege, um, encryption, and then we layer on something like zero trust network access. So I wanted to get your opinion on the value of zero trust network access as it relates to uh, folks coming into a data warehouse. Yeah, well, I think it's the, the concept of zero trust is not to trust anyone and validate each layer of authentication just to kind of back up. So I think that's true. I mean, if you if you were at a bank and you said, here's my crown jewels in the vault, right now let's call that a Lego because that's just how my brain thinks, everybody. So if you have this really important golden Lego sitting in your vault, uh, how many layers of security do you have getting from the street to the vault? Great, that's that's traditional security. But what the cloud has done is they bypassed most of those layers. So it's not like they go in and there's a checkpoint between the door and the teller and the teller to the manager and the manager to whoever manages the vault. And then you finally get into the vault and there's two keys. You turn simultaneously and then great things happen with that golden Lego. Now you can get from the street, you can dial into some virtualized infrastructure and you're right into that vault. So I think when you, when you think about zero trust as it comes to a data warehouse, it's even more important because you want to make sure, again, the right people have access to the right information at the right times and nothing else. Uh, this is not bathroom reading fodder. This is not just I'm interested in knowing who did dot, dot, dot. Uh, this, is, this is critical information for not only your, your company, but also the industry as a whole. Like, for example, if you're in a bank or a big healthcare uh, environment, you might have uh, data on patients or whoever's doing business with your institution. This might be their personal bank accounts, their investments, their corporate accounts. Uh, in, that, in the cases of healthcare, you might be talking about critical illnesses. You might be talking about prognosis, diagnosis. You might be talking about, uh, I don't know, sub illnesses or, or something that affects you, medication, whatever. These are all really important things that people want to keep in, in the, the sort of private sphere. You don't want those things to leak out. So from a data warehousing standpoint, we want to give you all of the robust security measures so you can take advantage of them. And even if you don't take advantage of them, as I know I can speak for Teradata, we want to enforce as many of those as possible to make sure you have uh, as much rigidity as possible inside of your security uh, approach as you can. And I know we're always looking for ways to mature our security footprint, not only for us as a company, but also that of our customers. And we have, we have a great story there over the last few years, another shameless plug to the same. Well, and I think too, to, you know, to pop in here, you know, it's really important to understand there's business data, there's customer data, there's employee data, you know? And so I know sometimes that, you know, just in the normal course of doing our jobs, you might be irritated by certain um, MFA steps or uh, other uh, policies and procedures that our organizations put in place. But the reality of it is organizations are truly treasure troves of this vast amount of PII, personally identifiable information. So when you look at from an employee standpoint, you've got your name, your social security number, your address, your date of birth, your phone number, your, I mean, you know, think about what access to that kind of information might be. And then maybe step back and let's give our <laughs> cybersecurity teams a pass sometimes on, you know, the, the annoyances that come along when, you know, we have to maybe do what we feel like is jumping through hoops to stay safe. But I think that's an important part of the equation here. I totally agree, Shelly. And I think if I can if I can recap on the two parts of the question that you know Joe asked, the principal least privilege, the concept of, of using that reduces the attack surface, right? Yeah. That's really important. 
uh, attack surface by minimizing things like the number number of potential entry points for unauthorized access. Right. It also ensures that you know things like users, systems, and applications only have access to the data they need to perform their tasks. Right. Nothing more, folks. Like let's not be uh, super excitable there. And then I think zero trust. The, the, the key word there is uh, we want to assume that no one inside or outside. That's my crazy explanation of the bake ball. Uh, can be can uh, outside of the network can be trusted by default. Yeah. Uh, you know every request needs to be verified and authenticated based on context. And the context in this case might be user identity, location, device health, et cetera. And we wanna enforce things like um, granular real-time access control. Uh, again, by adopting these things in a data warehousing environment, uh, not only my company, but yours too, can ensure uh, that even if attacker gains network access, they won't be able to move laterally and compromise the sensitive data inside. Yeah, yeah. And I, I really like something that you said about the fact that we forget that some of these systems are cloud-based and they bypass things, right? And so my next question that I've got for you is, let's face it, many of us are still in a hybrid world, right? Many organizations, for whatever reason, and they're varied and sundry, sit in a hybrid environment. And they've got data on-prem, maybe like in a colo, and then they've got some stored in the cloud. And what I think about, and I'd really like to get your take on, is if your data has to transit these two environments, what are a couple of the non-negotiable security practices that organizations really should have in place? Yeah, great question. I think that that sort of brings you pause because you think as a security professional, you have all these things at your, your ready and you're like, what two things? So you kind of put me in a box there. So if I had to think two things in a data warehouse, so thank you for the, the trick question, Joe. Uh, <laughs> and all of you listening, please don't judge me. She said a two, so I'm going to choose two. Uh, I mean, one, you know, and if you need to, I mean, you're a hard guy to four. pin down, bro. But if you need to go to three, I mean, we'll let you. Well, three is a better prime number, but we'll stick with two for now all and right. see where it goes from there. I love that, Shelly. Thank you for giving me a photo friend. It's awesome. So the idea here is I would start with end-to-end -end encryption, number one. Uh, we want to ensure that the data is encrypted again, both in transit and at rest, uh, using uh, the most up-to-date or modern uh, encryption algorithm. So again, just because you think it's encrypted, if you're using a legacy algorithm, it's probably not that great. And you should think about uh, really leveling yourself up like Teradata does. Again, another seamless plug. If there was a bunch of those, we should have an image like the Teradata. Wow. The pop up. Okay. Okay. Every we said it yeah. again. <laughs> and then, and, and, <laughs> Those encryptions pre uh, prevent things like interception and tampering during the data transit process uh, between on-prem and cloud environments. And if you have a really good hybrid data warehouse or uh, the best hybrid trusted AI uh, data warehouse on the planet like Teradata, then we do that stuff and you'd know that. If not, let us know and we'll show you. It's great. I'll the second it is Teradata. Okay. It is, but it's like a small T with a dot because okay. the dot really matters, Joe. It's not just to us, but also our customers. Right. It's super important. And then when you think about the next, I think about securing network connection. So first, end-to-end -end encryption. Second, securing network connection. I uh, use secure protocols, uh, such as things like TLS or SSL or IPsec for transferring data between environments. Yeah. Additionally, implementing things like virtual private networks or in the biz, we call it VPNs. Uh, or dedicated private network connections like AWS Direct Connect or Azure Express Route uh, that can further secure this transit path. Those two things can really, really help you out, especially in the colo environment. I like it. I like it. We can't have any conversation today without talking about AI. So we don't want to break, you know, we don't want to break the mold here. But as we know, AI is becoming more of a hot topic in the security sector and with good reason. So talk with us a little bit about your thoughts on how utilizing AI as it relates to security and access control in a data warehouse environment can make a difference. Yeah, AI is interesting. When you think about traditional AI, which we've used for decades, and then you think about generative AI, right? So when you think about traditional AI, it kind of... It helps you understand uh, the data that you have. And then Gen AI creates new data. Super high level. So for all of you folks looking up Wiki or your thesaurus, yes, I left out a lot of words, uh, but that's basically gives the audience uh, a basic general understanding. So when I think about the, uh, the ways that AI can help uh, as it relates to security in, in the data warehouse environment, I think, number one, anomaly detection. 
AI-driven security uh, can analyze vast amounts of data. And in your warehouse, that's what you have. You have ridiculously large amounts of data sets. Uh, so it can detect things like unusual patterns of behavior in real time. Uh, it can it predict like speed to understanding that very quickly because it can consume way more than a human can. It can understand uh, exactly what's right and wrong. It can ingest things like your threat feeds and say, hey, uh, Mr. and Mrs. User, uh, here's, here's some situation you might want to look at. I think uh, the identifying things like irregular access patterns or potential insider threats uh, human administrators might miss that on large volume, but the technology just won't. And then when I think about the second part, which is the dynamic access control. Now this is critical. AI can enhance access control systems by continuously assessing risk levels associated with access requests. Uh, based on real-time analysis, or at least near real-time analysis, AI is able to adjust access rights dynamic. Think about what I just said there, folks at home. I mean, this is a nugget dropper, right? It's like, doo -doo -doo, again, I should just do that. <laughs> no, just horn. Can't have enough air horn today when we're talking about security, right? Uh, again, it's 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 about uh, adjusting the access rights dynamically, ensuring that users only have access under safe conditions. These are two things I think are really important in the themes of tube here. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about a thorny topic balancing the need to have cost-effective ways to protect these different categories of data in accordance with the varying degrees of protection they require. Um, that's no small task in and of itself, but it's also, but there's, but there's a balancing act that's required here. So I think it's safe to say that an organization doesn't want to spend a hundred million dollars on data security solutions when estimated losses from a data compromise right, might run in the neighborhood of 5 million. So as a CISO, how do you balance these, you know, the, the balance of risk versus cost? Yeah, this feels like one of those game shows where you got like door number one or door number two. But before I do that, I like to use my channel. <laughs> and so now we can kind of talk about the you know the, the money conversation. I think balancing risk and investment is is cru crucial or or critical yeah. even in any security strategy. Sure. Right? As a CISO, I tend to emphasize the importance of things like data classification as a foundational step. So we have to put a value on our data. Uh, throughout the life cycle. Not all data is traded equally. Not all data has the same value. For example, uh, things that you release publicly, would you spend a tremendous amount of money protecting that or putting controls around that or preventing that from hitting the street? No, you're releasing it anyway. But maybe your corporate IT, how you compile your code, uh, what the recipe is uh, for inside that code, uh, those kinds of things, you'd probably put a lot more protection around that uh, because it's much more critical to the success of your business, right? Yeah. So uh, the idea of data classification for me is important. Um, but even with that, I think the uh, things like also your financial information of your customer, it warrants stronger protections. So things like, again, we've talked a lot about encryption or advanced access controls. Uh, sometimes less sensitive measures you may not want to encrypt and, and the, the public information, the, the general notes that are happening in between meetings. While that might be confidential and doesn't hit the street, that still doesn't rise to the specificity or cost restraints of all the other security mechanisms that I'm talking about. Yeah. So I think by categorizing your data based on sensitivity and maybe business value, you can alloc or, excuse me, allocate uh, security resources proportionally. So mm -hmm. if you think about all the I's, PII, IP, you know, PHI, whatever, that's the stuff that you really want to care about, high value information, right. uh, general yeah. conversation, maybe not so much, especially if it's Billy rambling all the time, you're like, no, nah, that's ne not necessary. We're not going to spend the money there. And then when I think about risk-based security, which is kind of how I open, I think the potential financial impact, impact of things like data compromise or, uh, or a breach, right, uh, changes the level of investment in the security measures themselves. Uh, leveraging cloud-based security solutions or managed security services can offer an offset of cost-efficient or scalable protections uh, without overburdening your, your overall uh, technical investment spend. And for me, the ultimate goal is to ensure that uh, security spending is justified uh, by the potential risk. I think security leaders, we can forget about it. Even me, I get excited sometimes with the technical innovation. I mean, forget about this is a risk-based thing. And we need, as, as security leaders, we need to manage into the risk tolerance, not necessarily manage all risk or drive down every bit of risk in your company, because sometimes that's not quite as cost 
uh, cost effective in the protection strategy, uh, and it becomes an overinvestment uh, in areas that don't pose significant risks. I think to me, one of the things that I see happening over the course of just over the last handful of years is the evolution of the CISO role. And, you know, much of what you centered on here is um, business talk, understanding business risk and the role that plays in developing business strategies. This is not just a security issue. This is a business issue. And so, you know, the evolution of the CISO role and being able to um, be a part of conversations at the highest levels within the organization on the board level, you know, as I mentioned early on in, in the intro, you're you're on many advisory boards. I think that's such an important evolution of this role and 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 the role that we're seeing CISOs play within organizations has has grown so much. And and to me, it would be exciting if if that was my job. I couldn't be excited more. I know Joe, you've been in this business a long time too. I think the involvement from you know traditional uh, pulling network cables to driving uh, maybe even uh, control-based sort of uh, risks uh, into what we are today. Yeah. Uh, I think we're, 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 we're great advisors across the business. And, it, and if you're in a place in a business where you're like, well, I don't really need a CISO, those people kind of kill my sunshine on a cloudy day. <laughs> and the reality is that's not true. I think that CISOs, if, if used correctly, these are the fast path folks in your organization. These are the HOV lane of how to get things done because they understand the risk and they can help you evolve solutions that really drive innovation into your company. Because really, if you think about the friction you have with security, that means something is causing that friction. Right. It looks like a denial of service attack. It looks like uh, some anomalous behavior. So some control is working as designed. But you, the user, are like, I keep hitting enter and nothing's happening. Like, this is terrible. Forget security. Uh, and turning security off is never the option, right? <laughs> so you never. Want, to, want to make sure that it's, it's working correctly. Uh, you're strategically aligned with your business objectives. Your security leader should think about the fundamental concept of why you're in business. I know I'm going to say something totally taboo. Welcome to Billy Spears being a guest on your show. Uh, listen, your business is in business to make money. Yep. Let's just put the emphasis there. And your job as a security leader is to help them do that securely by yep. safeguarding the digital assets throughout your environment. If there's any other rhyme or reason, give me a call. I'll help you out and get you centered. Uh, we can call my friend Joe, my other friend Shelly, and we can get you centered right <laughs> So good. You'll be safe, and we'll continue moving in the right direction. And your like days that. will be filled. Your days will be filled with sunshine. You know, I what? Feel I, like there's a T-shirt here, right? I love it. I love it. You know, love security. Kill my sunshine. You know, <laughs> you know. But I love your analogy of CISOs being like the HOV lane. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think we do. In many instances, we think about our cybersecurity teams as blockers, you know, getting in the way of my forward progress. And the reality of it is you are, you know, you're my guardian angel. And I think that that's an important way to view the role. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Go ahead, Joe. Another t-shirt, my guardian angel. Yeah. That's right. Have you ever heard folks talk about security? You get in a room and they're like security and they're like, security is a team of no. Well, I don't think so. I think security is a team of, whoa, let's get this done. And yeah. we're a yes, if society, right? We yeah. want to help you get to wherever you want to be. But we just want to do it a little safer. So if you have MFA, if you have privilege access, if you're using encryption, and if you don't know how to do those things, you should talk to your security teams. They're, they're stacked full of architects and engineers and operations folks that have, they do this day in and day out. They don't just sound like C3PO. They actually help you develop quality solutions to help you get to the end result a whole lot faster. They think about the things that you don't think, A, so you don't have to, B, so your customer can, can start to develop more trust and confidence in the product that you're putting on the street like we do at Teradata. So give us a call. <laughs> uh, well, I've got one more question for you, Billy. You know, I think we may have missed some some things in the conversation. Right? You know, Joe can barely even talk right now because you are cracking her up so much. So I just want you to know, well done on making my gal lose her composure. <laughs> Anything we missed, Billy? That's my question. I think the only thing that should be, and, and, and again, you know, we're not really influencing the outcome, but if you if you really want a differentiated model, you got to look at the strength of the parallel architecture in these uh, data warehouses and look for your, uh, your, your, your trusted hybrid AI solution when it comes to this stuff. 
And of course, I'm talking about Teradata. Teradata has been around 45 years. We started on-prem. We worked through the hybrid model. We are in the cloud. We can help you solve these things a lot faster. If you want to know about security, oh my gosh, my head's going to explode. We can get end-to-end -end rows talking in so much security that your head spins backwards and backwards and up and down. I, we have spent a tremendous amount of time, especially in this space, uh, really, really leveling up our security, going from an on-prem model to a cloud-native model, which gives you much more versatility. If you think about CNAP, that's another crazy acronym and probably a whole nother show. She was fun for myself to join these two ladies again. Uh, but when you talk about it, we've spent a tremendous amount of investment getting there a lot faster. So the idea is we have uh, the cloud-native uh, application protection platform in place. It's working. It's really, really cool. More importantly, even if you're not interested in our product and you want to check it out, give us a call. I'd love to kind of take you a walk through sort of the strategy behind it and why we designed what we designed uh, and how we did it. And then the idea here is it's not really about what charity has done. It's more about sharing the knowledge that we've learned along the journey with everybody else. So maybe, just maybe you can take one less Excedrin and bump your head in one less place than I did. That's why my head shaped kind of uh, long instead of the, the natural way it should be. But the idea here is we've learned a lot. We're so very proud of the result. I couldn't be prouder of the team. And I'm thankful for you guys inviting me on the show. Absolutely. Well, we are so glad to have you. And I think, you know, I hate to, actually, I was going to say, I hate to go out on a limb, but that's a lie. I go out on limbs all the time. I think that you have nabbed the award for the most entertaining, most fun guests that we've had. And we've done a lot of interviews, Billy Spears. So thank you for bringing it to me. <laughs> Thank right. you. I think it deserves an applause, not for me, not for both of you. I really, really appreciate it. But I, I do need to say one thing going out. Uh, none of this actually is possible in my journey without the tremendous amount of people behind the scenes that have helped. Yeah, that's here, Anita, uh, while, while I get the, the great opportunity to be in front of all of you, there's so many people on my team across the organization that uh, really, really made our transformation happen all over the last uh, two and a half years or so. So I can't thank them enough. Hopefully they're all listening and they're cheering at their house right now. It's amazing. So thank you all from me to you. And again, for, for you, Shelly and Joe, for inviting me on and getting to tell a little bit of our journey and talking about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. This, is, this has been amazing. It has been amazing. So Billy Spears, CISO at Teradata, thank you so much for joining us today for our conversation about data warehouse security strategies. You have shared some great information as we knew that you would. You brought the fun as well. And we always enjoy these conversations. We so appreciate you making time to hop on with us today for this episode of The Security Angle. For our viewing and listening audience, this is Shelly Kramer, Managing Director, Principal Analyst at the Cube Research. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. And just remember that Silicon Angle and the Cube and the Cube Research is your source for enterprise and emerging tech news. So keep it right here and we'll see you next time.